Hi, my name is Travis Benanti. I'm with the Penn State NAC Center. This is course ESI 211. The title of the course is Material Safety and Equipment Overview for Nanotechnology. The title of this lecture is Basic Characterization Tools. Okay, this is lecture one of the unit titled Basic Characterization Tools. Here's an outline of the talk. First, I'll give an introduction, then we'll talk about topics and instruments, including optical microscopy, propylometry, ellipsometry, a UV vis spectrophotometer, a scanning electron microscope, and we'll finish up with the atomic force microscope, AFM. This talk is designed to be an introduction to some of these topics. These particular tool sets, these particular tools were chosen because they're some very common instruments that are used in micro nanotechnology. This is not intended to be a comprehensive overview of the operation of each one of these types of equipment. Uh, there is a later course titled ESI 216, um, which will be a more comprehensive treatment of different characterization tools that are used in micro nanotechnology. So people have been using nanotechnology for um, many, many years. Here we're saying 2,000 years. Well, what does that really mean? Um, you know, when we're saying using, that's a little bit, uh, a little bit maybe misleading because what we want to be talking about is knowing and understanding what's going on at the nanoscale, um, being able to characterize and quantify and exploit materials at the nanoscale. So saying using technology for, for more than 2,000 years, what we're talking about really is that um, people have been unknowingly uh, using nanotechnology and nanomaterials for that long. Examples, common examples being things like metal nanoparticles being used in stained glass or um, soot type of fullerene molecules in the soot of flames. You know, people have been making nanoparticles for thousands of years, but um, there's a difference between uh, using and, and, and using a recipe to make nanomaterials and actually knowing and understanding and seeing things at the nanoscale um, and, and being able to characterize them. So one of the reasons that nanotechnology is so popular and, and is really a hot topic in research and science today is that we now have tools that allow us to see things at the nano scale. And when we're saying seeing, we're putting this in quotes because we're not necessarily talking about seeing with our eyes, we're talking about using instruments and uh, characterization, characterization tools to do the seeing for us or to measure things at the nano scale. So that's why when we say see, we're putting that in quotes. And this process of being able to see at the nanoscale um, is called characterization. So using characterization tools allows us to see and quantify things uh, at the nanoscale and measure things at the nanoscale. So this uh, note packet is designed to give you an introduction to some of the tools that are commonly used in micro nanotechnology. Again, it's not necessarily going to be a comprehensive treatment of all of these topics, but it will give you a nice overview of some of the tools that we see in the lab in micro nanotechnology. The first tool that we're going to talk about is the optical microscope. So of course the optical microscope is uh, is the oldest kind of microscope. I guess we're comparing and contrasting it to things like an electron microscope uh, or an atomic force microscope, which we'll talk about later in the lecture. Um, but an, an optical microscope, most people are familiar to some extent with how these are, are operated. Of course, they use light to, light to image a sample. So light is either reflected off or passed through a sample, and a series of lenses is used to magnify the image uh, one of the limitations is that in an optical microscope, we're often um, limited to magnifications of maybe a thousand x, uh, kind of a ballpark figure. But um, we're limited by the by the wavelength of light and also by the intensity of light that has to be shined on shined onto a sample in order to create a highly magnified image. It doesn't mean that, that optical microscopes are not useful. It just means that they have a particular uh, operating range where 
a magnification range where they're going to be the, the go-to instrument or the go-to characterization technique for samples. But then once we get beyond maybe around 1,000x, then we'd like to switch to other kinds of characterization equipment in order to overcome this limitation. And so uh, optical microscopes, even though they're relatively low magnification when considering electron microscopes, they're still very, very useful and uh, very sophisticated pieces of equipment. They can have computers to control the movement of the stage. They can have cameras attached to the optics of the microscope in order to capture images that are produced um, from the microscope. So um, even though we're saying that it's uh, you know, the oldest kind of microscope and has these limitations, uh, that's not necessarily a, a drawback. They're still very, very useful pieces of equipment. Okay, so on this slide we're talking about uh, bright field imaging and we'll compare and contrast that to dark field imaging on the next slide. And so in this, this is a schematic illustration where we're showing the light sources over here on the right hand side and here this gray thing is, is a mirror and the light is reflecting off of that mirror and then shining down onto the sample and then it's being reflected off the sample and then back up to our detector, which might be our eyes in, in most cases. So um, this up here would be the image that we're seeing with our eyes through the eyepieces of the optical microscope. Uh, and in bright field imaging, um, what we're seeing off the surface is, is light that is, is, reflected, um, is reflected from the objects on the surface. And defects on the surface then often show up as dark uh, dots on the surface. So the the light that, that reaches your eyes um, is the light that takes the path directly up to the eyepieces, but if we have little particles on the surface, those particles might scatter light that then don't reach your eyes, and that's why they appear to be darker uh, against a bright background. So we're now comparing and contrasting the, the bright field imaging to dark field imaging. The, the defining characteristic of the dark field imaging is that the, the light is not um, shining on the sample from a 90 degree or from a normal instance. The light is actually coming from an oblique angle. So here we have the light source at the side and the, the path the light takes kind of reflects at, a, at an oblique angle off of the sample. And the light that reaches your detector, again, you know, your eyes, the light that reaches your your eyes from a, a dark field image is actually scattered or reflected from the sample surface, and that's the light that reaches the that reaches the detector. So here, if we have just a, a very uniform or very clean sample, then of course most of the light is not going to reach your eyes. That's why we have a dark uh, background here. Um, but particles or or defects or things in the sample that are going to reflect light uh, off the sample or scatter light. Those are the things that are going to show up as bright features um, against a dark background in dark field imaging. And so here's just a photograph of, of one of the microscopes uh, in, in the teaching clean room and it has a, a very nice a movable stage, very large sample stage that can fit very large samples. A whole wafer could fit onto the sample. We have these different um, uh, objective lenses that can be changed out to achieve different levels of magnification. We have little sliders that can be pulled in and out to achieve bright field or dark field imaging. We have the facility to illuminate the sample both from the bottom or there's also a, a path of light that allows the light to come through the, the objective lens. So we have um, many different features on this microscope that make it very useful in imaging or in, in characterizing samples in micro and nanotechnology. Okay, so some of the topics that are often used in optical microscopy and other kinds of microscopy as, microscopy as well um, are things like resolution. So this is just a term for how easy or how possible is it for us to tell two very closely spaced neighboring objects apart. So can we resolve them or, or tell that they're separate entities or are they kind of blurred together as one mass? Um, this, this thing of numerical aperture, that describes the, the cone angle of the light that's collected by the lens. So for example, down here we have lens A and lens B. 
and the numerical aperture relates um, to the, the cone angle here. So this would be, uh, A would be a lower numerical aperture lens, and B would be the higher numerical aperture. And so what we see is that if we have a higher numerical aperture, we're actually able to collect light from a larger angle and then focus this up into our detector or our eyepiece. So this would be the objective lens, and then um, this light would be passing from the sample. The sample would be down here. The light would be collected by the objective lens and then um, uh, transmitted up to our detector or our eyepiece that would be up above there. So the idea being that if we use a large, a large numerical aperture that we can collect light, collect more light from our sample. The more light that we can collect, the more signal we can get from the sample, the better the image we can get um, from our sample. But there are drawbacks to this. One of the drawbacks is this thing called depth of focus or depth of field. And this is signified down here below as the black areas. So what we're saying is that the black areas to your eyes or to your detector, this would be the distance over which all of these features on the surface would appear in focus. So if a feature is, is maybe this tall, that would be all in focus. Or if a feature is maybe this tall, it would still appear to be in focus because we have a pretty high depth of field or depth of focus with this lens A. But if we go to lens B, which has a higher numerical aperture, again, maybe this would be uh, representing a, a higher magnification as well. Um, now our depth of focus is less. Um, we're having to use a higher numerical aperture lens because at a higher magnification we need to be able to collect as much light as possible and not waste it uh, in order to get a good image of our sample. So we're collecting light over this large um, cone angle, but what we're sacrificing is our depth of focus or our depth of field. And so here, if we have a feature that's this tall, what this is saying is that this higher numerical aperture lens, this feature might appear to be nice and in focus, but a feature that maybe is this tall, we can only focus on a section of the feature at a time. So with a very high magnification, this is something that is commonly experienced in the lab, is that when we switch to higher magnification, we can focus very nicely on, on shorter features. We can focus very nicely on small features like this. But when we try to focus taller features at a high magnification, because of the way the lens is constructed to collect the light, that it's more difficult to see or to image the entire structure at once. And so maybe we can focus only on the bottom of the structure, or we can focus only on the top of the structure, but it's difficult to get the whole high aspect ratio feature in focus at the same time at a high magnification. So the next characterization technique that, we're, that we'll talk about is profilometry. And a, a profilometer uses a, a very sharp probe. It's often called a stylus. Um, it uses this probe to basically contact the surface and slide along the surface and determine the topology of the surface. So for example, it's determining, determining a height profile of the surface as the stylus traces along the, the surface of the sample. So this is, this is very useful. It's, it's, a, it's a very uh, useful piece of equipment because we can use it to quickly determine things like film thickness or the roughness, the surface topology of the surface. We can also use it to determine step heights in micro nanotechnology samples. So it's a very useful technique. Here's a photograph in the, in the capabilities of the profilometer that we have in our in our teaching clean room, um, just to, to calibrate yourselves, uh, it's difficult to see on the on the photograph. But the little stylus is right here, right, is circled, and that stylus will come down and contact the sample. The sample rests on this sample stage right here, and so the way the the way the profilometer operates is the stylus comes down and touches the sample, and then it moves in a lateral direction. And as it moves across the sample, the height of the stylus is detected and it creates therefore a height profile or uh, a height profile of the of the sample as the stylus traces across the surface and so um, it's a nice piece of equipment because it has a very high operating range it can it can detect very thin 
um, films, uh, all the way up to relatively thick films. So here we're saying from about five nanometers, which is 50 angstroms, uh, up to you know greater than hundreds of you know hundreds of nanometers into the into the many microns uh, of of height difference. So it has a very a very broad operating range. Um, the things we, we can control on the instrument is we can control um, the, the scan rate, so how quickly does the stylus trace across the surface. We can also control the scan length, so how far does the stylus trace across the surface. Uh, we also have a particular size of stylus on the instrument. Um, the most common one is 12.5 microns in radius at the tip, so that very small stylus that comes down and touches the sample. It, it has a finite radius at its tip, which is, uh, you know, 12 and a half microns in, in our particular case. Here's an example of the data that is obtained when using the propylometer. So the white line that we're seeing here is the trace, so the, the data that was collected in doing this scan. So in this case, where we started was over here on the left-hand side. So the stylus came down and touched the sample over here on the left-hand side. Then the stylus moved across the sample. And as the, as the stylus moved up and down by going through the hills and valleys that were present on the sample surface, it created this height profile of the sample surface. And so we can see that here was a valley um, over here on the left-hand side. And then we came up to some kind of plateau and it traced along here. And then it went down because the the sample had another um, valley down here, and so on and so forth. So we went across the whole sample, and uh, it might be difficult to see the range here, but this range here is, is 2,000 uh, microns, and then this range here uh, is, is, it says 200,000 nanometers. So uh, again, that's illustrating uh, 200,000 nanometers uh, uh, being you know, 200 microns, so that's a very high uh, dynamic range that we have with the propylometer and then we have the facility also to, to tailor how far does it trace across in the lateral, lateral direction as well. Um, so we have, we have lots of flexibility with the instrument. And so what we do with the propylometer then once we have this data is that we can um, measure the step heights and also distances laterally on the surface. So here we have this green marker that's labeled M and we have the reference marker labeled uh, as R, it's red in color. And so um, down here at the bottom, there is an output that's a measurement of the vertical distance. So for example, in this case, we're measuring the vertical distance from this point right here to this point up here. And we're able to measure um, able to measure the height difference between those two points um, using this this data set. In this case it's saying it's it's like 24,000 nanometers which ends up being um, uh, 24 microns. Okay so the y-axis over here um, is actually uh, 26,000 nanometers, which, which would correspond to 26 microns. I think I erroneously said that it was 260,000, which is, is, is way too big, but in actuality, the, the y-axis there is about 26 microns. Uh, here's an example of how this, this profilometer might be used uh, in micro nanotechnology. So, for example, we might be interested in determining the thickness of a photoresist film as it's spin coated onto the surface. So um, this is often very important when doing photolithography. We have to have good control over the thicknesses of the films that are spin cast onto the surface. The profilometer is a very useful tool for doing this because, as was illustrated on the previous slide, we can quickly determine the thickness or the height of, of films that are cast onto the surface. So, uh, for example, each one of these data points was spin cast at a certain RPM. So for example, at 4,000 RPM, we then got this data point right here, which is uh, give or take 10 microns in thickness. And that data point was determined using the, the profilometer. So after spin coating, and then maybe after uh, photolithography and development, go to, the, go to the profilometer and measure the thickness of the film and get this data point right there. And so you'd have a series of samples at different RPMs, uh, different spin casting RPMs, and then take that series of samples to the propylometer, 
and determine each one of their thicknesses and get these data points. And then we can construct this spin curve that, that nicely illustrates how does the thickness of our features change with the spin, spin coding speed. And this was all done, again, with the profilometer, so it's very useful. This slide illustrates the profilometer tip. And so when we're using the profilometer, we have to keep in mind that the tip of the profilometer is not infinitely sharp. Um, it actually has a, a radius or diameter associated with it. And so in our case, we said that the profilometer tip uh, was 12.5 microns in radius, so 25 microns in diameter. Uh, and here's a, a range here. So if you're going to go out and specify a profilometer or a stylus tip, um, you could conceivably purchase uh, tips that range from maybe 0.4 microns to 50 microns in diameter. So there is some flexibility to get different sharpnesses of the tip, um, but they do have some, uh, uh, but there is a, a certain radius that's going to be associated with the tip of the stylus on the profilometer. For, for measuring or characterizing features that are relatively large, relative to the tip, this is, this is not really a problem. Um, or features that are relatively shallow compared to the size of the tip. Again, not really a problem. But there is an issue that, that you should be aware of that when using the, the profilometer, the size of the tip, the, the, the tip, the stylus itself, can get convoluted into the data that's collected by the profilometer. And this is gonna happen when the features are either very narrow, so over here we're talking about measuring something that's relatively wide compared to the stylus tip. Um, over here we're talking about measuring something that's relatively narrow or something that is, is very deep compared to the size of the stylus. So again, very narrow or very deep features um, have a problem on the profilometer because the, the tip, the stylus of the profilometer, um, may not accurately trace the sample surface. So over here, if we start over here from, from case A, this is a good example where it shows you know, a good data set that's collected by the profilometer. Here, our profilometer tip, the stylus, is our, is our 25 micron diameter tip stylus. And our features are relatively large, 20, 200 microns you know, in lateral dimension and only 20 microns tall. And so the black line is the actual surface, but the orange line is the measured surface or the data that's generated by the, by the profilometer as the stylus traces across the surface. So in case A, the data accurately reflects the actual sample because it's a very shallow feature and it's a very broad feature. So the stylus more or less traces accurately the profile of the surface. But here looking in case B, now we have a very broad feature. It's still the 200 microns in lateral dimension, but now the feature is very deep. It's 100 microns deep. And relative to the size of the stylus tip, what happens is that the stylus no longer accurately reflects no longer accurately traces the deep profile as it goes off this step. Instead, what happens is that the cone of the stylus now contacts the feature on the surface, and the net result is that the sidewalls appear to be sloped when actually they are not. So this is going on to a case where, in case A, the data was good, it accurately reflected the surface, Going to case B now, the data no longer accurately reflects the actual sample surface because of this limitation of having a finite um, stylus tip and stylus angle. And now we're looking at in case C, what happens when the features are, are very deep. And this is showing the case where we have the black line again being the actual surface, we have a case that is 100 microns tall and 100 microns wide. So now we have both deep and narrow and the profilometer trace doesn't resemble the sample at all. It looks like a little tapered, um, a little tapered funnel or something there. 
And so if you're, actually, if you're trying to make an accurate measurement on this sample, case C, the profilometer may not be a very good choice because with very tall or very narrow features that are on the, the size order of magnitude as the, the same size scale as the stylus tip, now we can't get an accurate representation or an accurate measurement of the sample surface because of this limitation of the, of the profilometer. So it's just something to be aware of um, with the profilometer that the tip does have a particular size and that can affect the data that's collected by the instrument. Okay, so now we're moving on to talk about uh, ellipsometry or the, the ellipsometer. Um, the ellipsometer um, is, is a, is a non-contact or non-destructive technique and it works just by shining a, a laser spot or a, or a light spot onto the film and by knowing something about your film, maybe the, the approximate thickness, or by knowing the refractive index of your film, then the data that's collected from the reflected spot, the reflected light that hits the detector, is then used to calculate the film thickness. So the next topic that we're going to talk about, the next characterization tool that we'll discuss is the ellipsometer. Uh, the ellipsometer uses a laser light that's reflected off of the surface to determine the film thickness or the refractive index even of the sample that we're trying to characterize. And so it's a non-destructive and non-contact te technique because if we're contrasting this to the profilometer where we had the stylus that goes across the surface, if we're just shining um, a laser light or a laser beam spot off the surface, then we can see that it's, it's a different kind of technique in that we don't have to actually touch the sample to get data uh, from the instrument. And so it's very popular for measuring the thickness of films, maybe the thickness of a silicon dioxide layer or the thickness of a silicon nitride layer on a wafer surface. It's a very popular technique. And so the way that works is that the ellipsometer uses a linearly polarized laser light source um, that reflects off of the sample surface. And when the laser light reflects off the sample surface, the polarization of the beam changes, and it changes from being linearly polarized to being elliptically polarized. And then the detector measures the state of polarization of the light when it's reflected off of the surface. And by, by calculating, by doing calculations um, that relate the reflected light beam um, and its state of polarization, it can use the optical properties of the film to determine the film thickness. And so here's a photograph of the ellipsometer that's in the clean room. Um, we can see that here is the sample stage right here. So the sample that we're trying to measure would sit right there. And then this is the laser light source on the left hand side. And this is the detector on this side. And so we can see that the the angle of incidence is going to be equal to the angle of reflection, so it's just like reflecting off of a mirror, and the laser would, would follow the trace that I just drew uh, on the slide there. And so we also have the ability to change the angle of incidence. So these things, the, the light source and the detector, swing up and down kind of like this. Um, so we can use uh, this additional flexibility as well to help us take more, um, more detailed uh, measurements of our sample. For example, if we take a two-angled measurement, we don't have to know the refractive index of the material. We can actually take a two-angle measurement and use all the data from both measurements to determine the refractive index of an unknown film. And then that refractive index could then be used in future samples to measure the thickness of, of films of unknown um, optical properties or unknown experimental films. Here's a schematic of the ellipsometer. So this was our laser light source over here on the left hand side. It passes through a polarizer which, which makes it linear, linearly polarized and then it reflects off of the film and then is passed to the detector and the detector measures the state of polarization of the light source after it's been uh, reflected off of the sample and by um, 
correlating the change in polarization and the optical properties and the geometry of the experiment by taking all of these factors into consideration, the um, computer control system can then calculate the thickness and optical properties like refractive index of the film on the sample surface. And so this also illustrates one of the limitations of the ellipsometer is that the sample has to be uh, reflective. So if this is our sample surface on the, on the back side of the, of the sample, there has to be a point where the, um, where the laser beam reflects off of the sample. And then on top of that reflective surface, we have to have translucent or semi-transparent films that are the subject of our characterization. So our films that are on the sample surface have to be semi-transparent so that the light passes through them and then reflects off the surface and then goes and reaches the detector where the change in polarization is measured. So that's just one of the uh, limitations or, or unique characteristics of the ellipsometer setup. And so for, for the particular ellipsometer in the clean room, we have this laser light source, so it's, uh, it's a helium neon red, red laser of a, of a particular wavelength. We said that we can change the incident and reflection angles um, commonly. Two angles that are used are 50 degrees and 70 degrees for two angle measurements. Um, there are other characteristics that are described on this slide. The notable ones are that it has a very, um, very broad operating range, so it can measure very thin films up to relatively thick films, up to um, microns thick, with a very high um, accuracy and repeatability. Okay, so the next instrument that we're going to talk about is the spectrophotometer. In this case, we are referring to a UV vis spectrophotometer. Here is a photograph of the instrument in, in the clean room. Um, it has a, a computer control, so here's where the data is, is read out there. And this has a sample door, so the, this little sliding door opens up in that direction and the samples then fit inside of the, inside of the instrument. And then we close it up because, of course, we're using UV visible light to uh, interrogate the sample, so we don't want to have any stray light from the outside getting in there. So that's why we have this enclosure to keep the light out. Um, the UV vis is very uh, useful. It can be used to measure uh, different types of samples, different states of matter. For example, uh, you could use solid samples or liquid samples um, with, with particular or special sample holders. Uh, it's used very often in, um, uh, to measure the absorption properties of things like organic compounds and also to measure the uh, optical properties of nanoparticles. Those can be measured with the UV vis spectrophotometer. So the major components of the UV vis spectrophotometer are the light source, which is going to be the source of the UV visible light. Um, there's also going to be some kind of facility to select the wavelength uh, of the light that's shining through the sample. Uh, there's going to be a sample holder, which is going to be the place inside the instrument, inside of that little door where the sample is going to sit for the measurement. And then after the light passes through the sample, there will be a detector that will measure the intensity of light that is being transmitted through the sample. So the most common way that that the instrument is operated is that we measure the amount of light that passes through the sample. This is the light that's transmitted through the sample and reaches the detector. And then we can take the difference between the light that reaches the detector and the light that we started with and we can then make a um, calculation of how much light was uh, absorbed by the sample.